Okay, welcome to our game theory lesson on three-person games, or three-player games. So the, uh, this section, in many ways, is the exact same as everything else we've learned. Uh, all the same general logic kind of applies, but it's the first time we're throwing three players into a particular game. Because of that, what we want to do is just take a little bit of a lesson and show how do we go about solving this. So how is a three-person game different or a three-player game different? Well, it's really not, other than the fact that there is now a third player, of course, instead of two players. It's the same thing, the same thought process you go through. Um, if it's a simultaneous game, we go through the same looking for dominant or dominated strategies or just look at each particular outcome to see if there is a Nash equilibrium. Uh, for a sequential game, we're going to be using uh, rollback or subgame perfect Nash equilibrium you know, to try to backward induction to try to find the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. The everything is everything's the same, so we can and as my explanation would, would have made clear, uh, we can set up a three-person game either with a um, extensive form or normal form. Either way is just fine. So that's, as far as the setup, that's all there is to this, right? I mean, there's no more grand differences that we have to look at. So uh, as we usually do, let's go through an example. Uh, the bar crowding game. Three people want to go to a bar. Okay, this is a bit of a silly game, right, as we start to look here. Um, but you could kind of see how this could be generalized beyond three people. right? You want to go to a bar where you don't want to go to a bar by yourself, right? But if there's too many people at the bar, the bar is overcrowded. So in our three-person little simple game, what we do is uh, we say that if, um, if you go by yourself, you're, you're going to feel pretty out of place. Some people can go to bars by themselves, I guess, but most people don't want to go to a bar by themselves. Um, but if all three people go, there's only two bar stools, so it's going to be overcrowded and they won't want to be there. Uh, so what's going to, how is this game going to look? Well, there's a payoff matrix that we're going to look to in a moment. Won't have you assemble this one. The normal form representation of the game is taken from the book. Um, so this is an example from the book. I don't think they use the names Gus Tolbert and Yelnick in the book. But uh, how is this game different from before? Well, as you can see, there's eight outcomes now, right? Instead of the instead of what we've had before with the two by two. So we've Gus and Yelnick, right? And this would be player one, this would be player two. If it was only a two player game, right? This would be the extent of the game, these four outcomes. Gus could go to the bar, so could Yelnick. Gus could stay home, so could Yelnick. But we also have Tolbert in there, and Tolbert could go to the bar or stay home as well. So if Tolbert goes to the bar, those four outcomes we looked at already are the four outcomes of the game. But if Tolbert stays home, these are the four potential outcomes, right? Because Gus and Yelnick could either both go to the bar, both stay home, or do one. One of them do uh, stay, go to the bar, and one stay home. So those are the those are the four possible actions for each of Tolbert's actions, which of course gives us eight particular outcomes. The one thing to mention on this that is not um, I don't have written on the slide, but it's pretty crucially important. Uh, traditionally, right, we've always had player one's payoff is listed first. Players two's payoff is listed second, and that's all, that is still the way it is. Player one, player two, player three. So actually I'm going to escape into the actual content of that, and I'm going to write this in right now here. So we have Gus's payout is listed first, Yelnick's payout is listed second, and Tolbert's payout is listed third. Sorry, Gus's payout, Yelnick's payout, uh, we'll say payoff here instead of payout. Um, and I mean, you could think of this as utility, right? How much happiness is each person getting from, from there? So if all three go to the bar, right, the bar is overcrowded, um, they each lose one. Move this down. 
If all three go to the bar, the bar is overcrowded. They each get a payoff of minus one. If they all stay home, they get a payoff of one. Right? And the payoff of one is universal here. If you stay home by yourself, you always get a payoff of one. You don't care what the other people are doing. If you can get to the bar with just one other person, you get a payoff of two. So you'll notice here, Gus stays home. At this outcome right here, Gus stays home. Both Yelnik goes to the bar and Tolbert goes to the bar. So what should the payoffs be intuitively? Well, remember, you stay home, you get a payoff of one, right? Watch television, you don't have to spend the money at a bar or whatever you're going to do. You're doing your game theory homework, right? What's more fun than that? So you stay home, you get a payoff of one. Uh, but if you can get to the bar with one other person, you get a payoff of two. So here, Gus is staying home, gets the payoff of one. Yelnik and Tolbert each get a payoff of two. So one, two, two. Up here, Gus is at the bar with Tolbert. Yelnik is staying home. So it's two for Gus, one for Yelnik, two for Tolbert. And over here is the other, where two are at the bar. Uh, if two people, um, if one person alone goes to the bar, that person gets a payoff of zero. You'll see there's three spots where there's a payoff of zero. That's where a person is at the bar by him or herself. So the actions here, um, you know, each player could choose to go to the bar or stay home. All three players have the same one. This is really a symmetric game. For class, I want you to find the Nash equilibrium or the multiple Nash equilibria of the game. Uh, do your best and bring that into class uh, the next time we meet.